Morning church, good to see you and um, it's my second week back in the pulpit so if I haven't got to see you, happy new year. I think we just keep saying it until we realize, hang on a minute, we're too far into the year and now it's a bit awkward but uh, yeah, I really count it a privilege to open God's word, especially uh, in the series that we're in called People Jesus Met, uh, part two, because I'm just being thrilled by seeing who our Lord Jesus Christ is. And I think you can learn a lot about someone by how they treat people who are supposedly lower than them on the social ladder. And I I remember uh, a pastor sharing with me that he had hosted this big shot American preacher in his home, and uh, this preacher had sat around the dinner table and had not even asked his kids who they were, didn't acknowledge them, didn't even notice that they existed. He was just talking about all that he wanted to talk about. And this pastor said to me how that had kind of shaped his view of this kind of big shot preacher and almost ruined the conference that he was attending because he kind of thought, well, if he doesn't even notice kind of the least among us, then um, yeah, that's uh, quite telling, quite telling. And I think that's why by contrast, it's so beautiful to look at Christ because he's the perfect man. He's man, God, God, Man, And so as we look at him, we, we, we just see something of the heart of God. So let's see who Jesus meets today. Turn with me to John chapter 4. John chapter 4 in the New Testament. And I want you to keep your Bibles open. I'm going to unfold the story. We're not going to read it up front because I want us to experience it as though we're there. As though we're experiencing this for the first time, even though you might know this chapter really, really well. I want us to kind of tell it as a story. So we're preaching it in the way that I think um, is fitting for the kind of content. And I don't want you to miss even a moment of this encounter. So keep the text open because I'm going to keep referring us back as we walk through these verses. So let's read just the first three verses for now of John chapter 4. And we're going to comment as we go through. Verses 1 to 3. The Pharisees heard that Jesus was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although in fact it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. And when the Lord learned of this, he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. So as this chapter kicks off, we see the Pharisees are pretty upset. They're playing the numbers game. They're saying, why is Jesus uh, you know, baptizing more disciples than John the Baptist? And they want to get into this whole controversy. And Jesus feels this is really, really petty. He knows which battles to pick, which ones to fight, and Jesus walks away. He doesn't want to be sidetracked from his mission. His mission is to seek and to save the lost. And our mission as a church is to call, equip, and send disciples for the glory of God. And so Christ doesn't want to get caught up in all this peripheral stuff, and he walks away. And as I came to the start of this chapter and I thought about it, I thought back on 25 years of being a pastor and how many elders meetings and leadership meetings I've sat in. If I was to do the maths, that's maybe a good few years of those 25 just sat around, sitting around a boardroom table, and I thought, I wonder how many discussions about insignificant and petty and irrelevant controversies we've had that didn't move the kingdom of God forward, that got us off mission and it just was kind of a sad reflection. But, but as I looked at Jesus, I saw he knows when to engage and when to simply walk away for the sake of mission. So Jesus leaves Judea, he heads back to Galilee, and then John says something that should absolutely jump out at us, but probably if we're reading the text, we would normally just skim over this. So let's pay attention and let's look at verse four. This should hit us. Now he had to go through Samaria. Let's read it again. Now he had to go through Samaria, and I say, John, what are you talking about? He didn't have to go through Samaria. Not at all. I know it was the most direct, shortest route back, from, Samaria, uh, back from, from Judea up to Galilee. I know that, but he didn't have to go because a devout Jew saw Samaria like he saw a plague. And so I want you to look at this map on the screen and kind of see the normal route that a devout Jew would take. So if you wanted to go directly, you would just go, if you're kind of in the Jerusalem area, just straight up through Samaria and up into Galilee. But that wasn't the normal route for most Jews. They would take this really weird route that was maybe double the distance. They'd go up to Jericho and it starts to get really hot and I've been to Jericho before and I've been there when it was 53 degrees Celsius. 
and then across up the Jordan Valley, all the way kind of through the desert up there, and then to Galilee. And so I say to myself, why on earth would a family man, a Jew, take his family on a road that is hotter, that is longer, that is more inconvenient, just to avoid going through Samaria? Why on earth would he do that? Well, it's because there was a deep hatred and prejudice between Jews and Samaritans. And just think how crazy it is. So deep was that prejudice that you'd be willing to take this inconvenient journey just to not even get within a yard of a Samaritan. What's going on? Well, in 722 BC, the Assyrians come in and they invade Samaria and they take it captive and they decide to settle Samaria with all sorts of different tribes and types of people. And the Jews that are left behind, over time, they intermarry with the Assyrians that have conquered their, 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 their domain. And now they become these kind of half-breed, half-Jews. They still, over time, come back and worship the true God. So they've got the same God as the Jews have, but the Jews regard them as half-Gentile, half-Jew. And so you can imagine some of the tension the Jews said, well, we're pure, you guys are sellouts, you, you've intermarried, you, you've kind of, we've lost our culture and our tradition. And then furthermore, when the Jews returned from exile, so back in history when the Jews, the true Jews, finally return, then the Samaritans are there and they say, hey, we worship the same God and we read in the book of Ezra that they even offered to help the Samaritans uh, sorry, the Samaritans even offered to help the Jews rebuild their temple. We'll help you guys. And the Jews uh, stiff arm them and they say, no, 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 no. You, you guys are sellouts. Sorry, we, we, you, you don't belong with us and, 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 and we don't accept your offer to help us rebuild the temple. And so the Samaritans are forced now to build their own temple on a mountain called Mount Gerizim. They don't worship in Jerusalem. And then the Jews come in 128 BC and they completely burn the Samaritan's temple to the ground. Imagine that, your place of worship. You've offered to help, they've said no, so you've been forced to build your own temple, now it gets destroyed. You can imagine the tensions and the hostility. And so when we read what John says, Jesus had to go through Samaria, I'm moved because Jesus is always on mission. I believe that he had a divine appointment with someone in Samaria. That's why this text is there. It highlights this to us because this should strike us as out of the ordinary, particularly if we're a Jew reading this. Perhaps Jesus has a divine appointment with you this morning. I don't believe in accidents. You might say, yeah, but I come last week, this is my church, I've been a member for 50 plus years. I don't believe there's accidents. Maybe you're here for the first time this morning and a friend's brought you. Maybe the Lord Jesus Christ wants to meet with you. Maybe he's been pursuing you and you haven't even recognized that. Maybe he's been softening your heart. Maybe he sees potential in you, gospel potential, that this morning you don't see. You've just started the year again. It's humdrum. You're back in the routine. But he sees gospel potential that you don't even see. But that's Jesus. He always moves towards those people who have a need. He always cuts through the prejudice of the day. And I just love him. He just stands true and firm. And, and there he is pushing through the prejudice, doing what God came to do, to love people who we might think are unlovable. Jesus went somewhere he didn't have to go. Jesus went to Samaria. Jesus came to earth. Jesus came to meet you. Does that still stagger you that Jesus didn't have to go and meet you? He didn't have to rescue you. He didn't have to come find you. But he loves to go places where you and I stop short. We have places we're afraid to go. We have situations we don't wanna go into. But Jesus' love takes him to those places. Because I probably can relate to the disciples. Where are they? Have a look at down at verse eight. Where are the disciples? Are they on mission? Verse eight tells us that they've gone into town to buy food. And I think that that's a humorous verse in scripture because I think, how many guys does it take to go to the drive through window? How many guys does it take to bring back a loaf of bread? But there they all are. They, they can't see further than their stomachs. They, they're not quite on mission. It's not that eating's not important to God, it's that they're missing this whole encounter of what Christ's about to do, and they're off doing their own thing. And much later, we see this. Look down to verses 31 to 35, when the disciples come back. So now they've missed this whole story we're about to unpack. I mean, it's like, come on, guys, you missed like the most important episode. Where were you? Um, we read, meanwhile, his disciples urged him. So they come back. Rabbi, eat something. It's like, this master of ours, he's always on mission. I mean, he's so spiritual. Just they're urging, just eat something, please. I mean, we've brought this stuff back. 
And then Christ says to him in verse 32, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Now they're scratching their heads. I mean, here he is. I mean, how did he get food? I mean, we're the ones that he knew we were going, we were gonna buy this. I mean, then his disciples said to each other, could someone have brought him food? Verse 34, my food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Do you not say four months more and then the harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields, they're ripe for harvest. That's Christ's passion for the mission. But it's sad but so true that Jesus' disciples often don't get Jesus, they don't understand what he's doing and they're off doing their own thing in their own time, off mission. And that's what Satan loves. He loves to take God's people and quarantine us. We are the carriers of the gospel, the gospel of good news, but if you can get us inward, if you can get us fighting about petty things, if you can get us just to be quarantined, the lager mentality, let's put our ox wagons together and not go any further. Let's not go to the dirty people, let's not go to the Samaritans. Then Satan's won the day. But Jesus had to go through Samaria and we're soon gonna see why. Here it is in verses five to seven. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? This is a beautiful picture of Jesus' humanity. We often focus that Jesus is God, but here is God down in the dust, down in the dirt. Here is God who is tired. Here is God who is thirsty. And John tells us that it was about the sixth hour when the Samaritan woman comes to draw water. And the sixth hour is noon. It is midday. So have you ever thought, why why did she come to draw water at noon? Why did she come during the heat of the day? All the other women of the day who came to draw water would have most, doubt, most likely come in the cool of the day. Early morning they would have gathered and they would have had a chat together in the community or they would have come late afternoon just around sunset. So why does she come at noon? Any thoughts or ideas? I think it might be because she wasn't in community. Maybe she was carrying some shame that she didn't want people to know about. Because even as it is in our culture in South Africa, for many people they have to draw water daily and we know that the community around uh, that communal water tap or a community around a stream as people are there at that stream drawing water or, or the, the community around a water tank, a water tower. So is it possible that this woman has come at noon to escape some kind of shame from her past or that she's carrying in the present, maybe to avoid the gossiping gazes and the whispers. And Jesus asked her a question that would have absolutely blown her mind. And you're sitting there and thinking, what are you talking about, Justin? What's the big deal? He just asked the woman for a drink. How would that have blown her mind? In asking her, in even speaking to her, Jesus is breaking every religious, every social, every political, every racial barrier known to the day, every societal norm. He's a Jew, number one, speaking to a Samaritan. We've looked at the history, so just understand the politics. She's thinking to herself, hang on a minute, here's a Jew, he's speaking to me, I'm a Samaritan, most Jews don't even come through this. She's beginning to just wonder what this is about. Then, he's asking to use her utensils. He's asking to use her bucket. He's asking to use her cup, that as she pours that water from the bucket into the cup, and as you think of back on apartheid South Africa, back in the days when some of us were younger and we knew what it was like to, to have a gardener and the gardener had separate utensils and, and dare we ever use that tin cup. I mean, we understand the, the history and some of the politics in our own country. But here's Jesus saying, I'll drink out of the cl a cup of someone who's regarded as unclean. Amen. And then he's a man speaking to a woman in public. Scandalous. Not only was he a man speaking to a woman in public, he was a rabbi. He was the kind of best kind of man speaking to a woman in public, but not just any woman, a woman that seems, from what we can tell, to maybe be carrying some shame. Maybe her community regards her as an immoral woman. A rabbi speaking to that kind of woman? The rabbis of the day had a saying. This was their saying. A man shall not be alone with a woman in an inn, 
not even with his sister or his daughter, on account of what men may think. A man shall not talk with a woman in the street, nor even with his own wife, and especially not with another woman. I mean, in those days, there was so much prejudice, never mind Jew and Samaritan, but male and female, that women were not educated. And so no man was expected to even have a theological discussion with a woman. That's a complicated matter and certain complicated subjects we don't even talk about with women. Rabbinical law even stated, it is better to burn the law than to give it to a woman. Imagine that. Imagine having such deep prejudice towards women that you'd say, it would be better to, work, to, to, to burn the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. Better to burn the law than to give it to a woman. And Jewish rabbis used to pray back in the day, Lord, thank you for not making me this and this, and they'd list off all sorts of strange, horrible things, and then eventually, and thank you for not making me a woman. Even came last, was their prayer. So just think about this. Get into the story. Just by speaking to her, she is intrigued by Jesus. This, is, this doesn't happen. This is not normal. It's breaking every social convention. And I think the same should be true of us. When Christ speaks to you, if he speaks through your, to, his, to you through his word today, your first emotion should be, I'm unsettled. And then as it unsettles you, don't be afraid of the truth that's gonna unsettle you, but then be intrigued. There's something about this man, there's something about this word, there's something about this truth that's drawing me in. And look at her response in Jesus' reply in verses nine to 10. Samaritan woman said to him, and here she is, you are a Jew. And I am a Samaritan, a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? And in case we hadn't got it, John puts it there for his readers. For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. And Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Jesus is turning things on their head. He's saying, Hey, if you knew, that this was a gift. And if you knew who I was, then actually I shouldn't have been asking you for a drink, you should have been asking me for a drink and I would have given you water, living water welling up to eternal life. She's thinking on the natural level and Jesus is slowly moving her towards the spiritual. Look at her response in verses 11 and 12. So the woman said, You have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself as did also his sons and his flocks and herds? And I imagine this woman at the well saying, surely the stranger knows that he needs a rope, that he needs a bucket. I mean, he's got nothing to draw with and he's saying, I I should have asked him for water. And then he's talking about this living water. Where on earth is he gonna get this living water? Because in that culture, living water meant flowing water. Living water was water that was found in a flowing stream. Living water in that culture was water from a spring versus stagnant water, which was water found in a well or water found stored in a cistern. So here we are at a well, and he's talking about living water. Where's the stream? Where's the spring? And maybe she's even slightly outraged that a stranger would come into her town to the well that she goes to every day, and this well, she knows it really well, and uh, I mean, this, this, this is her pride and joy, and maybe she's a little bit outraged. Who does he think he is saying that he's got water that's sweeter than this water in this well? I mean, are you greater than our father Jacob? This well has served Jacob and his descendants and his animals and his herds for centuries. And so I just love the the realness of this conversation. And Jesus' joy, you can sort of sense he's enjoying engaging with her and he's just slowly leading her towards deeper spiritual realities. Let's continue in verses 13 and 14. Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. I mean, think what's going through her mind. Maybe she's entering into this thought experiment and it's like, okay, let me just go with where he's he's going. Not fully understanding. Jesus is saying, you know, you come back here every day 
Every day for your needs and your family needs, you have to keep drawing water, but you get thirsty again, so you gotta keep coming back over and over again, but I've got water for you, that if you drink of it, you'll never thirst again, you won't have to keep coming back to this well. In fact, this water I'll give you will become a well within you that will well up to eternal life. John Piper puts it so beautifully. He says, you never get thirsty again, not because one drink is enough, but because one true drink produces a well for an eternity of drinks. That's beautiful. Not because one drink is enough, but because one true drink produces a well for an eternity of drinks. He's saying, this well, this living well, this living water, this living spring is the one thing that you've been looking for that can truly satisfy the thirst of your soul. And so many in our world today, maybe even some in this room, don't know that Jesus is the answer, that Jesus is the one that their souls are craving. Jesus is the one that that can satisfy and quench their thirst. We can have our deepest thirst satisfied by him and in him. And we're all seeking for someone or something to fill that emptiness, to fill our thirst. Think back, if you're a Christian of many years, what it was like before you were a Christian. I can remember those Sunday nights, thinking how depressing, I would get up tomorrow and just go through the motions again, especially at school, like what's the point of this? And the next Sunday night, I'm just gonna face the same thing, round and round it goes, and whew, I get a little six week breather in December, and then we do this all over again. And there was just this emptiness. And as a Christ worshiper this morning, you have this living water with you wherever you go. It's always on tap. Many of us are privileged to have water piped and tapped into our homes. Many people in the world don't, so they feel this daily burden of having to go and draw water. And maybe you've been in situations where there wasn't water and you had to buy water in advance and you had to ration and you had to think about it. You had to be aware water is a thing that gives life. It's not just available at a tap at a moment's notice. And so we don't understand what this was like for to hear about this living water a water that is piped into our lives, that is on tap because we have the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. So that means that as a Christian, if you are spiritually dry this morning, you have no one else to blame. The scriptures say we have everything that we need for life and for godliness. You have no one else to blame. A.W. Tozer says we have as much of God as we actually want. I read that, I don't wanna believe that, I wanna blame other people or blame circumstances. Tozer says, we have as much of God as we actually want. Tozer says in his book, The Pursuit of God, it's probably one of those books on the list that every Christian should read in their lifetime. A.W. Tozer, The Pursuit of God, he says, why do the children of God know so little of that habitual conscious communion with God which the scriptures seem to offer? The answer is our chronic unbelief and inward numbness towards spiritual things. This is the condition of the vast numbers of Christians today. A spiritual kingdom lies all about us, enclosing us, embracing us, all together within the reach of our inner selves, waiting for us to recognize it. God himself is here, awaiting our response to his presence. He wants us to respond. The eternal world will come alive to us the moment we begin to reckon upon its reality. That is a privilege in the gospel that we often take for granted. And so in verse 15, the woman says to him, sir, give me this water. And maybe this morning, there's an ache in your heart as we come to this communion table, Lord, give me this water. Lord, I need it. My soul is thirsty. I'm tired of of, of these streams that don't satisfy, that I gotta keep coming back to. Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. And just as she's intrigued, Jesus, the good surgeon, does something very painful. He begins to slice open her heart with his scalpel and exposes what's in there. Look at verses 16 to 18. Jesus, the good physician, tells her, go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you've had five husbands 
and the man you now have is not your husband. What you've just said is quite true. And what Jesus is doing is he's gently exposing her thirst. Maybe she hasn't quite recognized it in this way because she's just been finding satisfaction in relationships and he wants to show her the mirror. He wants to show her the mirror of the law so that she can see herself as she truly is, so that she can see her need of a savior. She's been married five times. She's now living in sin with man number six. She's maybe given up even on marriage and she thinks it's, it's not really any point. Like all of us, she's got this deep longing to be loved. If I could just be in a relationship, if I could just find Mr. Right, maybe he'll be number seven, maybe he's number eight, number nine. Uh, Mr. Right's eventually gonna come along, sweep me up with my feet, uh, and we can go out dancing and uh, paint the town red. We don't know what was going on in her heart. Maybe these husbands, some of them had died. Maybe she had the means to divorce them. Maybe she had some connections and some finances, which was hard to do in that culture. Or maybe the man just said, there's something in you that doesn't please me and she's messed up again. She can't perform sexually. She can't perform emotionally. She can't perform around the house with her chores. Something, and, 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 and now she's thrown on the trash heap again. Maybe she cheated on some of them on the side. And I think you and I can be like that. And you say, well, just now I'm happily married. I, uh, I, I don't see myself in this woman. But don't you also get bored with stuff in life Maybe it's not relationships for you. Maybe you get bored with other things. Maybe it's like that, the bank that has that logo, what's next? I've seen those billboards around Joburg. What's next? Maybe that's a fitting uh, billboard for your life. What's next? It's just, uh, I just get bored so easily. You know, what's next? What upgrade for my phone? You know, what's the next job? What trophy can I win? What's the next summit I can climb? What's the next triathlon I can do? What's the next holiday we're gonna go on? What's the next renovation I can do around the house? You know, what makeover can I have? You know, what's the next good deed I can, can do? What experience, what thing, what purchase? What shoes, what car, we could go on. What will make me happy next? And we know, we make that purchase, and by Christmas the next year, we can't even remember what we got for Christmas the year before, or it's broken. Talk to your kids, it's most likely broken by the 26th of December. We know what that's like. I mean, remember Solomon? There's lots of things Solomon tried, but if we just focus on the woman aspect, because there was tons of stuff he tried to suck the, the, the marrow out of life to say, this is gonna make me happy. How many wives did he have? 700. How many concubines? 300. So if the wives don't please me, at least I've got these 300 that I'm not married to, and I can just live out all my fantasies. That's a thousand women. I mean, that makes Hugh Hefner and the Playboy Mansion look like a Sunday school picnic from 1964. I mean, this is what Solomon says in, in Ecclesiastes chapter two and verse 10. He says, I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. I mean, a thousand women. I challenge you, go out and see if you can beat him. You can't. Besides the fact that if there was a thousand women in 365 days in the year, there's probably about three birthdays on average a day, three anniversaries per day. Never mind the thousand mother-in-laws, 700 mother-in-laws, and you just go on and on and on. He realized there's no hope, there's no meaning. Imagine him walking around in his luxurious gardens and seeing a pretty girl there and saying to her like, wow, hi, uh, I'm Solomon, would you like to go out with me? And she slaps him in the face, I'm one of your wives, you idiot. <laughs> but that's because he could sleep with a different woman every single night for three years and not even get back to the one at the beginning. Tested everything, we haven't spoken about his parties the amount of food that could feed 15,000 people and that's every day. So your little New Year's Eve party is another Sunday school picnic. But this is what he found. This is what he says. Yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had told to achieve, everything was meaningless. A chasing after the wind. He was trying to grasp the wind and I just can't find the meaning. It was like cigarette smoke. Where is it? What is it? I, I, it just doesn't have substance. I just can't find the meaning to life. I can't find happiness. He says nothing was gained under the sun. If I'm honest, a few little flings here and there, a little bit of buzz here and there, but really nothing was gained. I, I lay awake feeling empty. And this woman is as empty as Solomon. Maybe a little bit wiser because she's only got to man number six. 
And she meets Jesus at noon at a time when she doesn't want to be vulnerable, at a time when she doesn't want somebody poking around in her life, at a time when she wants to stay hidden. And maybe that's you. You just want to stay under the radar. You don't want to let anybody in. But Jesus sees you. He sees her heart and he moves towards her. He sees her shame. He exposes it so that you could see her need of him. And as I was preparing, I was thinking if it was me by the well that day, if this was your story, if we were reading this 2,000 years from now and you were the man or the woman at the well, what would Jesus have asked you to go and call? What shame are you carrying that he would have said, oh, go and call X, Y, Z? What would he have said? Go and call your temper? You come to church, everyone thinks you're great, but at home your family has to deal with your grumpy temper? And you carry the shame of that? Would he say, go and call your greed? Or your drinking? Or your lust? or your cutting of yourself, that you think you can hide from people and you just wanna feel alive so you bleed just to know, I actually am still a living, breathing person. Your eating disorder, your dishonesty, your unfaithfulness, go and call your arrogance, that arrogance, that selfishness, your addiction, your people pleasing, we could go on. The list is as long as the people in this room. And you say, go, why? Because he knows that if you come into the light, in the light you will find the light of the world. And so in verse 19, the woman says, Sir, I can see that you're a prophet. She realizes that Jesus has to be a prophet. He sees into her life, he knows stuff that she's told nobody else about. He hasn't been in the community long enough to find it out. Uh, there's something different about this guy. He's seen my past, he's seen my present. He doesn't even yet know that he's also seen the potential of her future. And he's relentless in his love and his compassion. He's relentless in his exposing of truth, but he moves towards her, and that's the thing that staggers her. He knows me, but he loves me. He wants a relationship, he's moving towards. He's this rabbi who's brought me good news, and he never should have. He's a Jew. Tim Keller says the gospel is this. We are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dared believe. Yet at the very same time, we are more loved and accepted in Jesus than we ever dared hope. Do you believe that? That's the good news of the gospel, that you, you're worse off than you think, but you're far more loved than you ever dared hope. And Keller goes on and says, to be loved but not known is comforting but superficial. To be known and not loved is our greatest fear. If, if we let Jesus in there, this, that's what this woman's thinking, ah, I'm not gonna be loved. When he knows this junk in my life, I'm not gonna be loved. Keller says, but to be fully known and truly loved is a lot like being loved by God. It's what we need more than anything. I think that's so beautiful. And some commentators say that this woman now is feeling this pressure and so she tries to change the subject. And that's maybe one way to interpret this, but as I read it, I don't see that here. I think she's moved to ask a very sincere question that isn't a sidetrack, but it's part of the same discussion. She wants to know where she can find this living water. It's the most logical question. Look at verses 20 to 24. She says, our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. So she wants to know the where question. Is this about worship and where do I go? And Jesus declared, believe me, woman, a time is coming when you'll worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know. For salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. Jesus is saying yes, it's true that the gospel is from the Jews. But I want you to see something that you've got it wrong. It's not about a place, it's about a person. Worship's not about a place, it's about a person. And there's a time coming when all these divisions between Jews and Samaritans are gonna fall away because it's not about whether it's Mount Gerizim or it's, it's in Jerusalem. It's actually about spirit, God is spirit, which means that you can worship him in spirit and in truth. If you come in truth and you're just vulnerable about who you are, 
then God can, can meet you at the point of your need. And if you come in spirit and recognize that you can worship God anywhere, at any time, in any place, this is, this is radical. And it's all happening because the time has now come because Christ himself is there. He is God. And God is a seeker. He is hunting down worshipers. Jesus says, that's why I've come here. This was a divine appointment. I knew you'd be here. I'm hunting you down. That's what he's subtly saying because God is always seeking worshipers to worship him. And so in verse 25, the woman says, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. And when he comes, he will explain everything to us. And then Jesus declared, I who speak to you am he. I who speak to you am he. He doesn't start the discussion and just rattle off his gospel presentation and say, I'm the Messiah, you must believe in me. He says, being gently loving, finding common ground, creating intrigue, interest, And then at the end, he reveals who he is. It hits her. The penny drops. Could this actually be the Messiah? Could this actually be the hope that my soul has been thirsting and craving for? And while she's still busy processing things, it's like John interrupts with verse 27 and says the disciples are now back. They're back. They've missed all of this. And I say, oh, come on, guys. You missed the most important episode. Where were you? And in verse 27, we read, they are surprised to find him talking with the woman, but they know better than to raise it or create a scene because Christ is still rocking their world. And then the scene flicks back to the woman and we read in 28 to 30, then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? And they came out of the town and made their way towards him. In fact, I think the Greek has the idea that they kept coming. They just kept coming. There was this, uh, and what a beautiful picture. I'm so, so grateful that the gospel writer recorded this detail. He could have left this out, but he says, she left her water pot, her jar. This physical thing that she'd brought there to get daily water that couldn't satisfy, she left it. And she went back to her town and she called people who were empty so that she could bring them to the living water so that he could fill the craving of their soul. There's her physical water pot, and here's the people that she's bringing to Christ. It's a beautiful, beautiful picture. And her physical needs only pointed to a deeper spiritual need. Jesus had exposed her shame, but in the light of her shame, she realized that it could be taken away. She was moved by his love. She was not an outcast. She had been found by somebody who shouldn't have found her. Could this be the Christ? Could this living water be sweeter than my shame? Reminds me of that song we sing. Our shame was deeper than the sea, but his grace runs deeper still. Our shame was deeper, deeper than the Mariana Trench. How deep is that thing? Like over 2,000 meters. Our shame was deeper than the sea, but his grace goes deeper still. It runs right to the earth's core, to the core of who we are. And no wonder, no wonder Jesus had to go through Samaria. Hindsight's a great thing. Drop down to verses 39 to 42, the last verses I want to read this morning. This is why he had to go through Samaria, not just because of this woman. Look at this amazing impact from verse 39. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, We no longer just believe just because of what you said. Now we've heard for ourselves and we know that this man really is the savior of the world. Isn't that radical? The gospel of John, the first people saying that Jesus is the savior of the world are the Samaritans. (laughs) That's incredible. He's the first group of people that he's saying, I am the Messiah. One of the most clearest declarations of his Messiahship is to them. I think the best evangelists are new Christians. Grace wears off, it becomes stale. The bread and the cup get moldy. They become stale to us. Grace becomes old. Her testimony was short. I've met this guy. He's told me everything I ever did. He's a prophet. Come and see. Friends, we need to meet Christ in that way again this morning at the communion table and just share tomorrow at work in some way of this one that we've met. Or are we still settling for things that can't satisfy when living water is offered to you, 
You don't have to go to a building. You don't have to go to a mountain. You don't have to go on a pilgrimage. You don't have to go to Mecca. You don't have to pray to the east. You don't have to go to a particular church. You don't have to find a temple. If you know Christ, you have a spring of living water welling up within you. It's like my friend Kevin who comes to Rosebank uh, who, who has this spring on his property. Just like outside of Randburg, it's a completely random place and the people, the neighbors say that this water has been flowing out of his front lawn for the last 50 years, it's never run dry. He's gone completely off the grid, he's got solar power for, so he doesn't have to deal with ESCOM and he's pumped into the, into the water there. He's had it tested, the stuff is so clear, there's a guy who's got a water bottling plant, he brings his bucky every now and again, fills up bottles. Kevin doesn't know what to do with the water, he can't drink it fast enough, he can't fill the pool, he can't hand it out. That's what this means. He's kind of, in a sense, off the grid. He's not exposed to the desert outside of him, the, the, the ups and downs of, of water shortages and water cutoffs. I mean, if people from Cape Town in that drought could have come up, they could have just completely satisfied themselves for years to come. I'm not gonna tell you where he lives. <laughs> I don't know if Kevin's here this morning. <laughs> but that's what this living water is like. And I think it's a privilege that we take for granted. So I close with the words of John Piper. When you go without water, your body gets thirsty. And the soul, when it goes without God, gets thirsty. Your body was made to live on water. Your soul was made to live on God. This is the most important thing to know about yourself. You were made to live on God. You have a soul, a spirit. There is a you that is more than a body. And that you, if it does not drink from the greatness and wisdom and power and goodness and justice and holiness and love of God, will die of thirst. Everything Jesus came to do and teach is aimed at providing the soul with food and drink that satisfies forever, amen. Well, as we come to this communion table, I want to just read three verses from the scriptures as I close off this message. There are three verses about water. Jeremiah 2.13. My people have committed two sins. Number one, they have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and if that's bad enough, Jeremiah says, and here's number two. Not only have they forsaken God, the spring of living water, number two, they've dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. That's our folly. We, we forsake the living water and then we still think we can create God on this side and it's broken cisterns. But Revelation 22:17 17 says, whoever is thirsty, let him come. And whoever wishes, whoever wishes, let him take of the free gift of the water of life. And then Isaiah, the verse on the front of the bulletin. Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. How are you gonna buy without money? Because it's free. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor, like Ecclesiastes, Solomon, on what does not satisfy?